All right, recording, recording. You're here, I'm here. Hey everybody, Future Zach here uh, from 2022, talking back to this episode recorded the week before New Year's. Um, This was supposed to come out at uh, the end of the year, um, but we had some technical difficulties that you're going to soon find out about. Um, The intro to this episode was kind of ironic because we uh, checked and double checked and even triple checked that everything was recording uh, because I'm paranoid that way. and unfortunately, my video switcher's um, file naming uh, apparently had a space at the end, which then corrupted all the files for some reason. Um, don't know why that's even a thing, but it did. So all of our YouTube watchers, um, there's no video to go along with us today outside of the logo that you'll see pop up here after the show, uh, after the intro. Um, but uh, for the audio listeners, you're not going to know any different. But I uh, just wanted to cover that issue for those that are paying attention. Uh, that this episode is kind of ironic because of the discussions we had around uh, production. So, uh, till further ado, enjoy. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery, and we are back at the end of the 2021. S- what's up? Is that thing recording? The computer? Yeah. Are you sure? I don't see the timeline moving. No, no, no. I'm talking about your laptop. I have it zoomed way out. Oh, look at that! You tricky devil. <laughs> we've we're made back the, we've made that mistake before <laughs> uh so anyways this has been a weird start to the podcast let's talk production <laughs> yeah you should have probably been like a producer on the morning show or something like that <laughs> you'd probably be that dude you remember that character that rob schneider played uh tech tech nerd you know, on snl or uh no jimmy oh, fallon played yeah it, it was jimmy just, fallon just and it. it was a couple guys but move jimmy fallon, move <laughs> That I can't tell you how often I do that, so yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an actual thing. Um, so anyways, last podcast of the year, uh, pretty exciting. We had a pretty awesome year. What do you think about uh, where we've come over the last 12 months? I don't remember what happened two weeks ago, much less what happened the last 12 months. We rode some machines, had some fun, and uh, that was kind of in a nutshell, 2021. I I did a whole lot more than that in 21. <laughs> we take over and everything else going on. I've been Did you? I've been uh slaving to the computer, I think. But uh but if you look back at our uh list of podcasts for the year, um we've done quite a few. Uh I had a goal of 50 podcasts this year and uh we didn't quite get there, but goals aren't necessarily. What did we hit? We hit uh 20 uh carry um, the 3 <laughs> 25. Uh we hit 20. Let's see here. How many is that? It's not gonna tell me. Anyways, uh, we hit I think twenty or um, why am I blinking on this? Thirty five. Twenty. It's twenty six or thirty six. Thirty five. Oh, today's thirty six. Today's thirty six. Yeah. Gotcha. So Captain uh, Literal over here. <laughs> looking back at uh, the podcast, we started off the year with a podcast with uh, our buddy George Hamill, um, who you didn't know before that podcast. Uh, but quickly we got to know him pretty, pretty deeply based off of his story. And that was one of our more emotional podcasts. Was that 2021? Cause the first, that was one, the first one of the year. Well, the first one of the year that that was just you and him then. Cause the first one of the year that we did was, uh, back in 2020. Cause I was pulled off on the side of the road on the way to Oklahoma. Uh, was it? Yep. Let me double check here. Guess my memory is better than I thought it was. Oh, you're right. I know I'm right. Dang you. Yeah. So that was, uh, mid last yeah, last year. Okay, so that was... Uh, I'm always and, right. That should be the last <laughs> thing you say before you go the, to bed. The uh, the thing I tell my wife is... Ian's always I, right. I might be wrong, but I'm never... Or I'm, I'm, I might not be right, but I'm never wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, we caught up with George Hamill after that one. Okay, yeah, so that was the follow-up to that. And then uh, we went into addiction coming off of their, um, their race up in uh, North Idaho, which was pretty cool, uh, racing in the snow and ice and mud and all that. Uh, we they went, do that again this year? That's coming up next month, yeah. Oh, they did it in December last year, I see. No, it was in January. The Hazard Fab? hmm Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I'm all screwed up, sorry. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually debating on whether or not to go up there. Uh, my dad was thinking about going up there shooting uh, photos. If it's negative five, I'm not going up there. <laughs> and it was negative 14 in my house this morning, so. Yeah, it was pretty, it's been pretty cold the last couple of days. Yeah. We've had an Arctic uh, drop um, this week, so. Uh, then we went into a looking into 2021 20, episode, which I think 
we probably end up doing again next month, um, looking at what we're kind of expecting, what we're hoping for, um, you know, just kind of a general idea of what right. we want 22 to look like. Um, you know, last year's looking forward into 21 had the whole COVID thing. Uh, it was right before the COVID. Was it right before? <laughs> imagine no, us, no, no. Imagine was, us being optimistic. <laughs> that was a waste of time. We, we had gotten into the COVID thing, but we really hadn't seen the impact truly. And, uh, and, um, so we saw, we were hoping that 21 would turn around. Uh, we went into some Yamaha and Can-Am rumors. Uh, I had spent some time with our buddy Lynn from Promoto Billet and Sector 7. Got to know him a little bit. Had a good time over there with Danny and the guys. Um, we hit it up with Al Macbeth, checking in on him up north in Canada. Uh, and then we talked about the Can-Am Commander. That came out as, you know, a refresh and a new product for uh, BRP. Uh, proving to be quite the uh, complete package, a kind of a merging between the Commander and the Maverick Sport that ended up being a pretty cool uh, unit. If you've been uh, in, had the opportunity to sit in one or drive it, um, they're quite the capable car. Um, and so that was, an, that was an interesting thing. And I still don't know what direction they're going to take the Maverick Sport, if that's going to stick around or if that's going to be you know, something on the chopping block at some point. Yeah, I know. And I haven't heard a rumor about that machine in a minute. Yeah, no, that's that's definitely been quiet. And the thing about BRP, uh, Can-Am, is that they've pretty much locked down even internally, you know, development news, rumors, you know, um, athlete information, things like that. Um, so the rumor the rumor mill on the Can-Am side is pretty hush-hush. Uh, but we do have a little bit of insight into, you know, possible machines coming out to compete with the new Pro-R and, and things like that. So... Maybe we'll talk about that in the look in the 22 episode and maybe throw around some rumors. Yeah, I think the rumor that we shared was we'd heard possibly like a fall release. It would be very cool to be pleasantly surprised and see it come out in June. You know, I think typically that's when Can-Am tends to drop new new machines. So Right. They might, they might ride the spring wave of guys um, updating their cars or whatever and then drop maybe a new car. Uh, right after that so that'd be interesting to see yeah i'm excited to see what happens yeah and i haven't heard a thing out of yamaha in a minute in regards to what's going on with like the the yxe uh i would not be surprised that you see an r max at koh racing this year i would not be surprised about that either because i was just going through um photos from this last year because i need to get a bunch of photos processed for content reasons and I noticed that there were some R Maxes really tearing up like Sand Hollow and, and places like that. And we know our buddy uh, Kelvin, he's got one. He's been tearing up the Northwest and his. Um, they're quite the capable car. They're a little bit top heavy as far as <clears throat> your um, center of mass. But they're, you know, you could see something out of that car if you wanted to put some money into it. Yeah, KOH this year is going to be cool. <laughs> I would imagine that you're going to see the Pro R out there and everybody's going to kind of fawn over that. But. I'm not gonna lie, man. Seeing a uh, a race trimmed R Max, seeing what a race team does to get that thing ready for an event like that would be really interesting. They already have such an aggressive look to them, you know. And you put into a race cage and suspension upgrades and things like that that you would that make a car look even cooler. Um, it would be pretty impressive visually just to watch and look at perform on the course. But let alone, you know, the idea that Yamaha bringing something different to the market, belt driven, not clutched, you know, things like that. Most of the YXEs that race KOH have a turbo on them, so it makes me wonder if they're going NA or if they put a if they put a little blower on it. Yeah, the the YXEs don't really perform in the the stock classes. They only really perform in the the unlimited classes. Yeah, you got to work on it to work Johnson. You work on a YXE to make it tackle Johnson Valley. They're a tough car, but there's some there's some stuff that a set of thirty two is really help. Out yeah, and you're not like doing that. that on stock. So, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, you know, moving on. In the year we went to, uh, we inter- interviewed High Lifter. Uh, we did um, HC at Brandon from HCR, which is a great time. Uh, looking forward to seeing those guys again out on the um, show circuit and, and getting into Utah. Uh, the Hastings family, John Crowley, that was a good, uh, good interview. Meeting uh, him online and, and talking through, you know, what he's done. I'd, I'd like to do a follow up episode with him, kind of talk about his travels this year. He did a lot of. Um, sightseeing and, and experiential stuff with different cars and different places. Uh, King Boss Squad, he's actually building a pretty sweet shop house right now. Uh, George Hamill again, Jim Beaver. Uh, Jim's an awesome guy. I can't wait to get him. I saw him at Sandsport. Um, 
super busy. The guy just doesn't stop, you know, and he, he stopped to say hi on the, uh, on the path. And <laughs> the gal with him was just like, come on, come on, come on. We gotta go. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we did a live stream experiment, which has led into a few different, uh, live streams here on the podcast. And I think 22 is going to involve a lot more of that. Um, we got to get kind of into, uh, figuring out what day works best for everybody. Um, you know, everybody does go to work and, you know, has limited time to be online and participate in these shows. So, uh, you know, we've been traditionally doing it on like Wednesdays, uh, which is kind of in the middle of the week where you might have the time to afford to, to take a break and, and participate or, or put it in the background and while you're working. Um, so if you're in the comments below, let us know what day works best for you. Is it a Monday through Friday thing? Is it a Saturday thing? Um, is live just something you don't care about? Or would you like to maybe be more involved? Maybe actually have a call-in episode or a, sh a regular part of the show where you can call in and ask questions. Um, we interviewed Wyatt and uh, BJ from Addiction at uh, Takeover. We did Ruslan and WCI, Wilkie and Buggy Whip, Russell. That one was tragic. I uh, we we had some great dialogue in that one. I think we lost like maybe eight to ten minutes or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there was a production issue where yeah. I stopped recording or whatever, and, yeah, and we lost like a the gold nugget of the episode was lost. It was still a great episode though. Yeah, it was a great actual discussion, and I think if yeah. if you missed that one or if you don't remember that one, go back and rewatch it. It was a good episode. Yeah, for sure. Um, we had Macbeth. Um. Uh, that was uh, a great one too. And that was with yeah. uh, the Titan monster truck driver. Yeah. Um, and so that was a kind of a cool uh, discussion about jumping and, and extremism on how you ride and drive and entertain people. Uh, and then it was cool just talking to a monster truck driver about yeah, what they do. We could do an episode with Macbeth and just talk about setup, the whole thing. That's it. He, he's got a lot of really cool information relative to how it is that we ride these things. Yeah. And, and not just for big hucks and stuff like that, but sure. just in general trail. I mean, the guy, that's where he lives is on the trail. So he's a firefighter. He's a mountain man. He's, he does it all. So, um, and concept distributing his, uh, fab business. That's all they focus on is, is safety, driving, suspension, all those things. Yeah. Some of the best equipment in this industry without a, without a doubt. You know, I I get irritated when people say that, but when you see a guy going 80, 90 miles an hour and get pitted and walk away, it says a lot. Or jump 220 feet and nosedive and do a cartwheel and then walk away from that. Get pitted. <laughs> so pitted. Um, and then we went into some predictions. Uh, we went to, uh, we saw Hebert uh, at TakeOver Virginia. That was cool to see him there. Uh, we interviewed Brent uh, from 212 Gloves and, and talked about his car. What up, Brent? Uh, we talked about your Idaho trips, your overlanding trips, and my Virginia recap. Uh, Idaho has uh, been kind of one of those things we keep going back to. Um, and Why on, wouldn't we? <laughs> on the news uh, the other night, they were talking about how it's the fastest growing state for like three, four years in a row now uh, in the country. So, If that can stop anytime soon, that would be super. But well, let me, let me you, move first. Let there, me move in first, and then you can stop. Well, there's a, there's a lot of people from like King County moving over there, too. I could... I could name you five right now that moved within the last 24 months into Idaho. And, you know, people that, people that are born and raised in the Pacific Northwest, not a real big deal. But like, if you're going to go try and make the big mountain life and stuff like that and move out of a, an area like Southern California or New York or something, want to move into Idaho, there's a reason Idaho is amazing. So just keep it that way. Yeah. You know? There's definitely a, uh, and, and, and understand that the population that already lives there, really feels that way so oh, without a doubt yeah don't, don't be surprised that. don't be surprised that you might get some friction when you move in and uh let's make sure to to give them space and and well be, and i don't people aren't like that i mean they're not going to give you friction or anything like that but they start to see their straight state drift away from what it is that uh you know i mean historically people in idaho you got access to that whole state you can go anywhere you want there you know there's no shortage of people out there that'll make the comment that idaho is what america used to be and uh you move there because you want to be you want to be a part of that. So make sure that you're doing the things to stay a part of it. I mean, if you look what's going on in Colorado right now, uh, I've been looking at doing the Colorado BDR for three years now, and I think I have to do it in the next calendar year because it's very likely going to get shut down. You know, I you got you've got even the Jeep community is ticked off at the side-by-side -side community. You know, they'll go up like Ophir Pass or something and they'll make a comment about how you got to battle side-by-sides the whole time. Well, my workaround for stuff like that is I never I never wheel on weekends. Why would you? 
you know, you're just going to battle traffic the whole time. So I try to target like weekdays to go do stuff like that. And I think it's just, I mean, Colorado as an entire state and the entire off-road network may very well become freaking Moab for side-by-sides where it's just resistance, resistance, resistance. I think the the other side of that, the flip of that coin of the Jeeps and the side-by-sides and the trails is that the side-by-sides have to deal with the Jeeps too. Like it's a, oh, it's a, without a, doubt. It's a, it, it's a, it's a real mirror thing. And the thing is, is that the, these, these side-by-sides are having a more amped time than the Jeepers and the Jeepers you know, don't get that experience. And then they just see, you know, they have to pull over for these guys all the time. Well, uh, some of the most dangerous situations I've been in on trail was guys driving Jeeps out of shape, you know, right. They're out there getting squirrely, even out in the dunes. I've run into some instances where I was coming around a Toyota or coming on a blind corner. And, uh, next thing you know, this guy's about ready to take me out. And that's not, Hey man, I own Jeeps. I own Toyotas, but it has to do with the person behind the wheel and nothing to do with the machine they're driving. Right. And, and this, the thing is, is that we all share these resources. We all share these trails. We all are doing the stuff we love. And just like the, the side-by-side guys <laughs> that are on the trails have to respect other vehicles and put up hand signals and do the responsible thing, pick up the trash and all that. So does everybody else. The Jeepers need to do that. The car drivers need to do that. The hikers need to do that. The bikers need to do that. Everybody needs to p- play their role in this whole game that we're in uh, called off-road Otherwise, we all lose. Well, people see a resource that they want to explore, they want to tackle, and they only want it accessible to the various ways that they recreate, whether it be hiking, whether it be mountain biking. You know, I mean, when you it's go their down, thing, not well, yours. I mean, when you see a single track mountain bike trail and you see a guy on an enduro bike run up, it, it's going to tick them off. And I respect that. You know, most of those mountain bike trails, like those downhill trails, are hand cut by mountain bike riders. So all the work that they did to groom that trail is getting torn up by a two stroke or a four stroke. I get that, you know, it would, it's just, people just need to use some freaking common sense when it comes to stuff like this, man. It, it's really simple. There's no reason a freaking quad should be going down a single track trail, a single track enduro trail, a single track mountain bike trail. There's no reason for it. And you know, just over and over, you get these knuckleheads that are just going to do whatever the heck that is that they want and ruin it for everybody else. And it goes, I mean, even like right now in winter where we have a ton of snow outside and on the mountains, everybody wants to go explore the mountains in the snow. Uh, You know, most places have rules around digging ruts through the snow and you have to have a tracked vehicle with a tracked license. Like up here in the Northwest, we have, if you go up here to North Idaho, you know, it's closed to anything that's non-tracked. And then you have to have a snowmobile license paying your fee into the system to to groom and maintain the system. Uh, to be allowed to, to do that. So uh, it's just it's just the respect and the, the care and the maintenance of these resources that we have, we have to pay attention to. Yeah, I used to ride sleds about 10 to 15 years ago, and we're, we're a little shy right now on snow, but it was, uh, we would have trips scheduled to go into the mountains of Montana. And when the winter would come to our neck of the woods, we'd cancel those mountain trips because it was actually more fun to go rip cross country across Wheat Hills than it was to go up into the mountains. I mean, you could hold faster speeds. All of the shoots are there. All the drifts are there to bust. All the drop-offs and stuff that the Wheat Hills create, it was a lot of fun. And plus, you got all these small communities, and these communities are cool enough. You could just rip the snowmobile into town, fuel up, and then go rally up with your buddies. You look at like the communities up in Michigan, Minnesota, those areas where snowmobiling really kind of started and took its foothold and grew. Um it's all flat and it's all hills sure. and it's, it's not mountains. So that's kind of where the industry started. And there's a lot of fun to be had there. You don't have to be in a mountain to have fun on the snow. Yeah, it's fun though. Let me tell you. I uh, Well, that's I, the biggest growing snowmobile segment is mountain riders. So. Yeah, I've, I've gotten about 50 times more scared on a snowmobile than I have on a, on a side-by-side. No question about it. I've been in some really critical situations on a sled where I was like, I need to get out of here. Yeah, I never really grew up on sleds as far as like it's kind of like a luxury sport because it's a very niche part of the year and it's a very expensive hobby and all that stuff. But the times that I have ridden snowmobiles, it's definitely an experience like a it's kind of like dirt bikes versus, you know, riding in a truck, right? Like you you have a completely different experience because you are one with that machine and, and you're going to die if you screw that up. So I've had three or four winters out in the farm that you couldn't leave the house to go get supplies for the house unless you had a snowmobile. And yeah. that's why I bought it. Cause it was just another tool. If you have to go check cows, you go down the sled. If you got to go to the store and it's too, it's too gnarly and the drifts are too gnarly, you got to get on a sled. Right. So, uh, I had a little mountain max 600, then an RMK and yeah, 
they're, they're fun. You know, I've always thought about getting back into it, but if, I mean, the last amazing winter that we had out here was about 12 years ago and you know, you just can't justify having an eight thousand dollar toy sitting in the garage. Well, and nowadays goes they're out maybe ten to fifteen thousand. If you look at the nice ones oh, that are capable sure. of doing everything, so it's it's like I said, it's it's a luxury hobby for sure. Um, just to wrap up this last year's worth of episodes, uh, we've had Bustin' Knuckles on this. I'm actually wearing a Bustin' Knuckles shirt today. Um, and talk to those guys if you haven't checked out their YouTube yet. Go check it out. There's just always good content to watch there. Um, we talked to Brian Crower. He's a super uh, unique and interesting dude that that runs one of the best performance games for the UTV, entering the UTV market, coming out of the automotive market. Uh, him and TPR are really kind of changing the game for what you can put into these motors. Uh, Jim, uh, Jimmy Sacone from Evo was an awesome interview, um, talking to him about you know where they started and what they're doing. And uh, they just got uh, the Pro R stuff, so they're they're wrenching down on the Pro R, and we're going to see some performance gains from them on that. So go check their uh, channels out and follow them for updates on that. Uh, we talked to Greg, uh, the guy that runs and operates uh, Rugged Radios. That was always uh, he's such an amped up dude. He's always just like 110 percent amplitude. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, he's a hype man. So that's funny because it just that's his world, and that's where he lives, and that's exactly who for he sure. is. Um, talked to. Uh, uh, Divit Race Parts, uh, which I didn't realize were just our neighbors here in Idaho. Uh, so that was cool uh, with Brent inside of the uh, Orange Crush, which was an interesting uh, podcast. Uh, we talked to Dune and Destroy in a hot tub. That was interesting. Yeah, the heck with those guys. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we went through the whole Pro R launch. The, the culmination of years of rumors and discussions that we've had coming to fruition uh, was an interesting uh, arc in that, uh, that storyline. That was a big episode. Man. That was probably <laughs> our biggest episode of the year, wasn't it? I would, I'd have to go back and look at the metrics, but I would assume that it obviously, you know, talking on the 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 topic that's gotten the most views, the most page views, all yeah. that stuff. So yeah, that was that, that was fun. We got a lot of engagement from the community on that one. That was bitching. And that or was, no, I'm sorry, it was the launch, not the. Were you talking the pre-launch or the launch? The launch. We oh, had yeah, the pre-launch, the was, and then we had the launch. Launch was sick. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how do you feel about doing the live? coverage of the of an event like that that was our first yeah it was your first attempt at doing a live coverage with me about an event you know it gave me an opportunity to make fun of a lot of people and i always <laughs> I, I really look forward to that uh no it was great i i thought it was fantastic man we had people uh dming us uh direct on our cell phones through facebook through the chat windows on the live feeds i would probably say during the course of what were we on the air about two hours yeah yeah, hundreds, Hour and a half hundreds hours. upon hundreds of uh, DMs, messages, and stuff during that during that live feed. It was freaking bitching. Uh, we were we're wrapping up the year. We did our holiday gift guide. We did our holiday um, deals uh, and all that stuff. And then the Polaris Ranger XP Kinetic launch came out, and we covered that one just like we did the Pro R. Yeah. Um, now that we're a little bit out from that launch, kind of any new insights or thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I mean, in terms on the holiday gift guide, I did have a Boxo Koh tool bag show up at my house unexpectedly so uh just I, just just I saying just, i did just, not receive one i just uh, wanted to rub i just that wanted in. to uh bring that point up that somebody got something and i didn't oh man it is oh. <laughs> hashtag not sponsored no no it, it was sweet <laughs> I, I, I was blown away i opened that sucker up and i was just like yeah yeah that thing's not leaving the and ramp. it's not really that much bigger than the roll if you consider no, it it's like, a lot bigger it i mean it's double. is it like double the size yeah it's over double actually so, and it's got it's room like for a expansion size, too. Like, I, I mean, it's like, there's a Molly outside on it too. So like I could actually strap my first aid kit to it if I wanted to. It's, uh, it's got room to add some tools that it doesn't, that you might think you need out there, but I'm telling you with what's in that thing, I could disassemble the whole car. Very, Not that I'm going to. I wouldn't know because I haven't looked inside of one yet. So yeah, if you're nice, I'll let you look at it, but <laughs> That's what she said. Um, and then uh, following that, we had uh, a little wrap up episode, episode with Adrian uh, talking about his Baja run and uh, Mint 400 run. And that was a good episode. Go check it out. Shout out to the San Diego firefighters. Uh, and uh, and then today we're wrapping up the year with uh, kind of this discussion about, you know, maybe what what vehicle to be looking at if you're looking to buy a UTV in 2022. CF Moto, Zach, shut it down. I got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I got a, a chance to ride one of those uh, in Virginia, which is actually kind of one of their bigger markets, that East Coast trail system market. Um, and that car is actually pretty interesting. It looks way better in person than it does on on paper. 
Um, but it is a loud machine. So yeah. I don't yeah, know if I'm you've not ever hate, one. I mean, nothing wrong with affordable, affordable fun. Nothing wrong with that at all. If it, as long as it's reliable and safe, then giddy up. So if we're going to be talking about, so we did this last year, we did a, what UTV to buy in 2021. Um, and in the idea of 2022 coming up and, and maybe revisiting this topic, um, that episode actually was one of our highest performing episodes of the podcast. So, uh, I, I feel like this is a, something that we should probably do every year where we kind of just look at what models came out, what to look at, uh, for next year. If you're looking to buy a lot of people held off buying a UTV this year because of the pro R announcement. Um, so if we were to look back at some of the product launches that happened this year, uh, what has changed, what hasn't changed, um, you know, we can kind of get a good idea of what to recommend to people. Um, so before we jump into our picks, um, something I did notice, and this might really be tied to COVID plus supply chain issues, but this year was a big trend of trim upgrades. So there wasn't really a lot of model upgrades, right? There wasn't a lot of like pushing the envelope for a model upgrade. There wasn't, you know, Polaris going from 140 whatever horsepower to 186 horsepower or, you know, anything like that. It was more like, okay, a few more trims get ride command or a few more trims get a roof or a few more trims get, you know, smart shocks or whatever. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of model upgrades. There was just kind of like the trim expansion, right? Um, I don't know if that's a trend that's going to continue into next year once the supply chain catches up or if this is going to be kind of just the new normal. Yeah, I, I, I would tend to agree with you. You know, with the exception of the Pro R, there wasn't a heck of a lot. You know, the R Max came out and I think everybody kind of had a good inclination that they were going to go with a dual sport and I think they nailed it. You know, I think it really hits a niche and, you know, there's no... Um, and the Commander came out. Yeah, with as many with as many new riders that are coming into this, there's a lot of people that they're going to buy to a degree. They're going to buy what's available. And before we get into this with our recommendations, if you buy something that says Honda on the hood, Polaris, Can Am, Yamaha, who else am I? Who am I forgetting? Kawasaki. Kawasaki. You're going to be happy, without a doubt. And if you're not, and if it doesn't scratch an itch of the type of riding that you want to do, there's a formula to get it there, without a doubt. The aftermarket supports all these machines really well. Yeah, there's a if I don't know if you follow him, but there's a YouTuber for the automotive world uh, review world called Doug DeMero. He's hilarious. Uh, he's a he's a car nerd, just like I'm a UTV nerd. Um, and uh, one of the things he says is that you can't go buy a car right now and buy a bad car. Like there's very it's pretty hard to buy a straight up bad car. And uh, obviously he's never driven a Hyundai. <laughs> no, even the new Hondas are nice. Take it back. <laughs> so um, the the idea with the UTV world is that it's pretty hard to buy a bad UTV at the moment. Like the only thing that it would be a bad situation would be is if you don't buy to your expectations. Yeah, I've, I've listened to people bag on every machine that there is. You know, I've, I've heard people say that the Kawasaki is too heavy to dune. Well, you ever seen one rock crawl? They're insane. You know, I've seen them dune. <laughs> well, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I've had people say that, uh, you know, the, the X372 inch is too wide for such and such trail system. Uh, well, they make a 64 first and foremost. You know, there's there's an option for that. But yeah, it, it, it's just well, first world problems, man. Like there there's so many great machines out. You mean I could have fun in a freaking Honda Pioneer for sure. Well, how many times have we been to a rally event or something like that and seen a bunch of pioneers or a bunch of little drawn deers or whatever. And they're all having fun. They're all having a great time for sure. So, uh, prefacing this episode with the idea that it's hard to buy a bad car, as long as you buy to your expectations. Um, it, it's really, you're going to have a good time either way. So, uh, the biggest thing, uh, would be to adjust your expectations. You need to define what you want out of your UTV and your UTV experience and feel free to be picky, you know? I would never settle right now. Like if there's a machine that I want to target and I want to get, I'm not going to let somebody talk me out of it. Right. And, and that's, that's kind of the crux. A lot of people have been in over this last year is, is what's available. I just want to get into the sport. I just want to have a good time, get away from the house, get away from work, get away from whatever. And so they go to their dealer and they're just like, you know, whatever comes in, just let me know and I'll buy it. Right. 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 Um, yeah. I think the only company that we left out was speed and I really don't have any new details on speed. I want to, you know, I, I mean, have I, you ever driven one yet? Well, I've been in one, but I mean, <laughs> but have you driven a production look, car? Here's the deal. I'm not hating. Well, <laughs> I'm not hating yeah, either. You're, you're, I guess it's and you're not going to hear me hate, man. Right I mean, now. it's like like when I hop into it, it's like perfect for me. I'm six foot four. Like I fit in that thing like a friggin' dream. They're There's amazing. plenty of room in that cab. Oh, they're killer. I, I want them to come out. I mean, all, all they're going to do is push everybody else. 
Yeah. So I mean, real you saw quick, that thing freaking jump. So real quick, just to get this part out of the way for the end of the year episode, like we saw that car kind of progress over the last couple of years, right? And how they've chosen to build their motor, how they've chosen to build their suspension, how they've chosen to uh, build their drivetrain, all those things, right? Um, and one of the big selling points of the Speed UTV was double shear everything, upgraded bolts, upgraded hardware, upgraded cage, upgraded everything, right? Uh, to where you're not having to buy aftermarket, whatever. Now we're looking at uh, the Pro R being released. The Pro R comes out with beefier suspension, longer wheelbase, 14 millimeter bolts, like common components, common hubs, common bearings, common across the board, just basically everything that speed was supposed to be like solving and replacing in the industry. The pro R comes out and does most of that outside of maybe the symmetrical part, like the component parts where you can swap them left and right. But, um, for the most part, they've fixed all those problems with the pro R. Um, and the weight of the pro R versus the speed UTV is comparable as well. So that being said, does speed really actually have the, uh, the purchasing draw outside of just being different and new and attached to Gordon and all that stuff, does it actually have a logistical draw versus a pro R? I think it does, but it just has to be available. Uh, if he, if he, if, if he announced that they're going to be starting to funnel down the assembly line and take delivery, like within 60 days or something, you're going to have people requesting to hop in line. Like you wouldn't believe take that car for what it is, you know, the four seater or the two seater. And then you look at the way that it's laid out with the bed and then I start to think about what it is that I do, where I go out and guide people. I opt for what I know is or what I can make the absolute toughest, most reliable machine possible. Like if the point car goes down, there's trouble. No question about it. So it's one of those situations where I look at that machine, I look at that truck bed, you know, it's got a, it's got a legit bed to it. Like I know it's made to desert race and I know it's made to go out in the dunes and have fun. I could turn that thing into the biggest, gnarliest, toughest mountain machine that would put, provide me exactly what I'm looking for. And that is the utmost confidence that I'm going to get off this mountain and that the people that are behind me know that the guy leading it is on a machine that's not going to let anybody down. And like, when I look at that thing, I look at what I can pack. I look at what it's capable of. It checks every single box. I just, I want to drive it. Right. So, but my question is, in relation to somebody coming into the sport wanting to buy a car, does going with something new and unproven, I mean, quote unquote unproven, right? Like we don't have a, a couple of years under the belt for the car versus a manufacturer with tons of experience, tons of technology, tons of investment, tons of resources and engineers putting together a car that competes on the same level um, with parts that you can buy from dealers in your neck of the woods, share parts with people in your neck of the woods, um, and has a proven track track history of, of proven performance. Is it is it easy to recommend the speed to somebody, or is it just one of those options where it's like, well, if you're feeling frisky, go buy that one. I don't. I would. You know, if it comes out and it's everything that it's advertised, I would have no problem recommending it to somebody. I can tell you this: I mean, everything that you just talked about about the assembly from a legit OE, the pro is fixed. It's we found out what was going on with it from an electrical standpoint. There's a little your, your pro, y- yeah. The fuse block or the, the, the fuse panel, what, what I don't have visibility on it, but basically what happened is there's a wire that was loose and it was loose from the factory and it had to get soldered because the nut holding that wire in couldn't be pulled off because it and three other were stripped onto the freaking block. That came from the factory. That's sloppy and it kind of ticks me off. You know, it is what it is. Not everyone's perfect. Not everybody doing this assembly is perfect. And I'm, I'm sure you can say the same thing about every manufacturer, but I'm just telling you, like, when you look at the marketing dollars, the engineering dollars behind every OE, it doesn't mean you're going to get the, you know, something that you're not inevitably, inevitably going to have some problems with. You're going to have to start fixing on stuff. So as, if speed comes out with a machine that is comparable to, to the pro R to, to what Can-Am's bringing out, then we've got a cool decision to make as a, as a consumer, you know, I can go this way and it'll do this. I can go this way and it'll do this. To be honest with you, are we going to, you know, if the speed comes out and it's like 200 horsepower, 250 horsepower, and then a 300 key or something like that, is it the premium machine at that point? You know, if it, if you can buy a factory 300 horsepower car, yeah, I say it would be. 
but you're going to have you're going to have three pinnacle machines that are be pretty dang neck and neck because if if the rumors are true and there's a three speed sequential can am coming out that's 75 inches and freaking 300 horsepower from the factory you bullet best believe Polaris is going to have something within 6 months well they're, they're i mean they're going to send out a pro r with a turbo on it i mean we've seen patents for options that they could go down right like routes they could follow with transmissions and and sequentials and all that stuff so we know the options are there right uh, the big question would be is how fast, how long do they sure. push the product life out? How do they, you know, they traditionally don't put, um, a model release like the pro R right next to a model release upgrade, right? They traditionally put it a couple years out from each other. And so, uh, like with the, the XP turbo, right? The 16 was the launch, uh, model. The 17 fixed a few things here and there to make things more production ready and, and viable, uh, but then they didn't have an upgrade to that platform until I think 2019, which is another two years. So from product launch to product upgrade, it was basically three years. So I would assume that the Pro R is not going to get any upgrades for the first couple years, at least. It depends on what Can Am does, man. Like if Can Am comes out with a 300 horsepower machine, if Robbie comes out with a 300 horsepower machine, I think they're going to be really, really put pressured to to respond. And, well, I, and but but the thing is though, is everybody knows they have the chassis to do it now. They've got the motor to do it. They got the width to do it. They got the durability to do it. You know, the this new Pro R with that Pro Star in it is not going to be a weak car. And that when you put it on the scale, that it tells you that. You know, I mean, you don't gain 500 to 600 pounds on a machine over a freaking uh, little one liter. You don't gain that without some wall thickness differences, without stronger A arms, stronger trailing arms, and they've done that. Well, and if you look at like. Shock Therapy just put out a, one of their Tech Tuesday videos where they went through the. You are such arm a honk. And, you watch everything. <laughs> I, I I can't tell you how much enough how much ma- how much of a nerd I am about the sport. So. I watch I watch Comedy Central roasts. That's what I watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I pretty much could have called that one out. <laughs> I just drive, man. <laughs> but uh, but anyways, I mean, if you look back at the idea that three years ago just or even two years ago when we were suggesting people to buy a certain brand or a model or whatever utv there was a lot of just consideration into what do all your buddies ride are you going to have the same parts as them are they going to have the ability to help you get off the trail if you need help or you them um and nowadays we're looking at some of these cars where the fun the functionality and the durability of the cars have progressed so far upstream that do we really need to rely on other people having the same parts or is it just more along the lines of, you know, your car is capable and, and can get you where you want to go. You just have to be not stupid. It's handy. You know, when we go out on trips, um, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't coordinating and having a chat window with all the Can-Am guys. You know, if there's guys out there with 72 inch machines, we start to go down a checklist. All right, you pack this, I'll pack this, you pack this. And this is our plan in case somebody breaks a tie rod, breaks an A-arm. You know, we've got solutions for that. Yeah. It's, it's smart. You have to do that. And the Polaris, you know, the Polaris guys do the same. Like I took the Pro R out on the last expedition I did. And it's kind of a unicorn because it's a long travel Pro R. So there's very limited amount of parts that could be interchanged. But believe me, if I had a belt issue, if I had a, if I had a clutch issue or something like that, somebody would have had something. Right. So something to think about, you know, when you're looking into buying a new vehicle, if you're looking to buy a new uh, UTV in 2022, uh, you know, go through the entire rundown of what you think your experience is going to look like and then start troubleshooting it as if like things went wrong. Figure out if you need to have something common with your buddies that you ride with. Like my brother doesn't really go riding with a whole lot of people other than like me and a couple other people. So they, they all are razor owners and they all have the common parts, right? So it makes sense that way. Um, but the, the idea of, of getting out and doing what you want to do uh, is really going to necess- necessitate what you buy with the vehicle or what vehicle you buy based off of, you know, how you want to handle any kind of emergency scenario. So if you're going to be, you know, going out with a bunch of Duners that are going to be ripping the dunes and having a good time all weekend and have a high likelihood of hitting witch eyes or G outs or breaking stuff or whatever, um, you know, you're going to have more commonality on a Can-Am side. Whereas if you're a guy up in the mountains where you just need to go have a good time, get to point A to point B, you know, maybe pull uh, some some wood up the hill or, or whatever, you're going to have a whole lot more commonality with the razor owners. So kind of just look into, 
your ecosystem of friends and vehicles and what you're intending to go ride and make an informed decision, uh, not just based off of what someone says like us. Let's get into it, dude. So, hey, speaking of which, though, you're the RZR. How many miles are on that thing now? On the turbo? Yeah. Uh, 36, 7, something like that. Of that 36, 3,700 miles, how many did Zach put on? <laughs> About half of them. <laughs> um, so hopefully that I, I'm looking at options for this next year. So everybody, you tell me what you want me to buy. I'm looking at options to buy. We'll see where it takes us in the next couple months. I can speak on behalf of the community. If it doesn't have a turbo, get out of here. <laughs> well, maybe I need a, a non-turbo just to combat your turbo upgrades. Good luck. <laughs> so uh, anyways, let's talk about the average consumer, the guy that just wants to have a UTV to go recreate, have fun. They're not looking to push 80 miles on the sand. They're not looking uh, 80 miles an hour on the sand. They're not looking to do extreme hill climbing. They're, ex they're looking to have an all around purpose built vehicle that supports their desire to get outdoors and do things. Um, I know my pick, uh, I have two picks really, but What's your pick for for the average um, off road experiential consumer? I like the XP one thousand general. You know, if you want to do some yard work around the house, it's equipped to do that. If you want to build it out into a wheeler, it's equipped to do that. It's uh, you know they're reliable, they're tough, they're freaking comfortable. And I'm telling you, on some of the trips that we go on, there's some cabin closure options for that machine that are really handy. So you could you could essentially do a cabin closure on that car put a heater in it if you wanted to and i know some people are probably smirking like oh eh, you know wimp who needs a heater or anything like that well come wheel in with me one of these days and you'll appreciate <laughs> that heater but um the 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 general even a two-seater or a four-seater i think they um i think they scratch that itch the only complaint that i have about the um the the uh the general is like from the factory i think they should they should gear it and send it out with some 32s so they did upgrade um some of the the features on the 22 models uh, 21 and 22 models uh so like the new uh xp 1000 comes with um if we're talking about the like, kind of like the ultimate trim uh comes with 30s uh 10 15 30s so uh they're not bad they're not what they used to be they used to be the 27s um, run it to the fuel capacity real quick there i thought it's I just the it. nine and a half yeah nine and a half yeah so uh, even with 32s that's probably good for about 125 plus you know, if you're really getting into the gas, I'd say on the low side, you're probably... And they don't take a lot of gas. They're not big guzzlers, so they have pretty good economy. Just an FYI, an eco mode being kind of delicate on the throttle, I was getting 125 out of my X3, and that's GPS confirmed. And, and that, that's on an Evo Stage 3R. That was a Stage 3R on 32s. I was getting about 125. Green key, eco mode, kind of ginger on the gas, so that's... <laughs> I'll tell you one thing though what really surprised me is you know I, I was pulling in at 125 miles the fuel lights on it's telling me i got to fuel up that thing's got either a nine or a 9.5 i think it's a 9.5 and i was only putting, <laughs> i was only putting about 7.8 in it sometimes seven you know so they, it was it was it was fabricating no question about it i did go ride with some guys in cowies and i assume it's just the way that the kawasaki's geared cowie doesn't have a turbo and my x3 and the pro r was getting much better mileage, like substantially better mileage. Like we right. had, we had some guys on Cowies that we, they were running on vapor. Yeah, they're, they're much lower geared, right? Uh, which actually speaks to what they're capable of and why it's nice for some buyers right out of the gate. Uh, it makes more sense for them. So uh, you picked the General XP one thousand for the general purpose consumer. I think there's a lot of attributes that would make that a reason why you'd go that way. That include decent horsepower. You know, no turbo to worry about. Uh, you know, overheating or, you know, belt temps, things like that in relation to the power. Uh, you don't have to worry about clutch and all that issues and stuff like that um, that come with trying to push high horsepower and high speeds. Uh, it's more truck-like. You can just step in, step out like you would like in a small truck. It has the bed. It has just a lot of those creature comforts I that make it feel. I love the doors on it too. And the interior is really comfortable. But here's the thing. And this is a disclaimer. I'm not going to recommend something I haven't driven myself. And I've gotten a lot of miles on a general and I've enjoyed it. You know, I haven't wheeled a commander and I've only been in a defender maybe about twice, but you know, unless I put 300 miles on a machine, it's going to be really hard for me to recommend it. And I've done that with a general. Yeah. They're a proven platform. And, and my recommendation for an XP 1000 general, uh, is one, 
if you're looking to buy now, there's no reason to hesitate, right? There's It's a proven platform. It's really well supported. The aftermarket is there. You can get HDR long travel for it if you want. There's just a whole lot of like things you can do with that car and it's already set up to do. And especially if you look at some of the new trims they came out with, um, they have like the new Trail Boss edition um, and uh, they go, to, go to the Barf edition. <laughs> the Troy Lee Designs Edition? Yeah. You know, Troy Lee is infamous. Uh, Troy Lee basically got his start. I think he was doing custom graphics on Jeremy McGrath's helmets back when Jeremy was the king of Supercross. And that's kind of how Troy Lee, if I remember right, that's kind of how Troy Lee got his start. And uh, since then, he's branched out to a clothing company. And now, uh, as you can see, he's doing uh, designs on on uh, generals. And it's kind of an aggressive color scheme. It's not really my thing. But... Troy Lee historically has done some pretty cool stuff. And if I remember correctly too, Troy Lee actually has his own helmet line too, safety components. Yeah, they have, uh, <laughs> they're, they're mostly a moto, uh, company, but they've been hired out by Polaris to do a bunch of stuff, including jerseys and things like that. I really like the look of that trailhead edition though. The color scheme on that is really cool. Yeah. So the trailhead edition, uh, comes with a matte blue and copper color scheme. And then it has, uh, included in the, in the bed of the vehicle, it has a whole rack system and shelf system that basically gets you 99% of the way f there for storage, uh, in the back of the UTV. So the winch is critical though. You know, I, I think I'm, I mean, unless you're really stripping a general or a ranger down to its bare nuts to get it uh, the most affordable you can possibly get it to, I think that most of these machines would be, it would behoove them to put a winch on it from the factory. You got a little light bar on that bumper too, I noticed. Yeah, I don't know if that comes with it. It might on that edition, the trailhead right. edition. Um, but uh, but anyways, the the what I would call the ones to look at would be the XP1000 Deluxe and the trailhead editions. Uh, those really are the two to look at, in my opinion. Yeah, the um, color the color scheme on it too, and not that I really care about the color schemes too much, because most of the stuff that I would drive inevitably winds up getting wrapped. But from the factory, it looks really cool. Yeah, so they have a black scheme, a silver scheme, and a, and a camo scheme, along with the Trailhead Editions blue uh, the, and copper. Um, anyways, great car. It comes in both two and four seat models. Um, they start uh, at around twenty five ish. Um, and Remember go when all they were eighteen? Yeah, well, they weren't XP1000s, though. Those were the XPs, uh, or the, just the 1000s. So if we go take a look at the uh, 1000s, they start at 17. Right. Uh, but they are not as well equipped. They're stripped. They're stripped down quite a bit. Right. Um, they still have the same horsepower. They still have roughly the same uh, width and all that stuff. They have less clearance, smaller tires. Don't have um, the shocks. Don't have a winch. Don't have a bumper. Don't have a roof. You right. Know? And I would say that the suspension, tires, wheels, and shocks you know those are all things that really play into that decision to buy the xp 1000 versus the the just the 1000 standard model um so my pick was the can-am commander xtp um and that's with a caveat there's an asterisk on that recommendation so the asterisk is if you are a smaller person that is not as large as i am this is a good recommendation for you if you are a larger person this car will feel small and you'll want to look at the general um but uh, for 98% of the world that is not over 6'2 and multiples of hundreds of pounds, um, this will be an amazing car for you. So this is the car that came out this year um, that Can-Am kind of replaced the aging Commander platform with. And they came out with the Commanders um, and they have different models and trims and all that. But the XTP line uh, has the upgraded tires. It has the upgraded suspension. It has the, uh, up it has the winch. It has... All the things it has a dump bed on it, just like the general has. Um, it has everything you want in a general purpose, all around adventure vehicle. Uh, and it even, and when it came out, they announced it as a two seater. And the first thing we said was, is there a four seater? Right. And it wasn't there. But then they came out later that year and said, hey, look, here's a four seater. And again, to clarify, it's an awesome machine. And the only reason I can't recommend it, I've never been behind the wheel of one. Yeah, and and I I haven't given any um, tire time on the trails or anything, but I've talked to a lot of people that have, and from everything that they've said, it is a one to one comparison with the general as far as performance, if not a little bit sportier with that kind of like Can Am feeling throttle response, if you know what I mean. Our buddy over at UTV Guide loves it. And yeah, John Crowley. Yeah, John's put a lot of miles on it. Uh, it uh, I've seen him what San Hollow. Um, What's uh, all uh, across the country, actually? Didn't he take it on the Rubicon? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. He, he's a big fan of it. Um, but what we're looking at is, you know, the same sort of um, 
horsepower. Uh, the X3P comes with Fox 2.5 podiums. That's a big deal. Which is a, a huge deal, actually. Um, it comes with, again, 30-inch uh, 1015 tires. Weak sauce. Uh, which is matches the General's tires um, from those trims that we recommended. It comes with the same type of clearance, maybe a half inch more. A um, little bit longer wheelbase, which is great. In a car um, like that, you got 10 gallons. I probably, tra- you know, uh, just based on my history with Can-Ams, you run like a naturally aspirated Can-Am with 10 gallons, man. I wouldn't be surprised. John might be able to answer this, but I wouldn't be surprised if that thing could go 150 miles. But, you know, the other thing I liked about it is it's only 17, 1,700 pounds. I like the machines that start out pretty light. Yeah, so it, they're and not. And I think the General's right around that too, though. As far as weight? Yeah. Uh, it might be a little heavier. But. So if we go to here and we look at the uh, curb weight yeah. on uh, dry weight on the general two seater is uh, about seventeen hundred pounds, and the that curb weight on seventeen change. Uh, the Commander XTP is you know, about seventeen hundred pounds, so it's about fifty pounds more. But I'd be interested to to check that Polaris on a scale, though. I I think that that might be being a little generous that it's that light, but who knows. Well, I mean, these are without fluids or anything like that. So, right. um, but, uh, but anyways, so if you're a bigger person, the general is going to be perfect for you. If you're anything but a bigger person, the commander is going to be awesome. Um, and I think that, you know, if you look at, uh, just the, the way that they built that car, it's, it's, it's a one-to-one comparison plus some. So, uh, I guess if you are, uh, if you're going to be in the market for a sport utility vehicle, those are the two to look at, in my opinion. So let's talk about sports, sport, pure uh, sport vehicles. Oh, we hate talking about that. <laughs> people, people uh, hear us talk all all the time about either duning or or long trail trips or things like that where we we want to go fast and and then go for a long experience. Um, before we jump into this, I think most people will uh, understand what your recommendation is going to be. Um, uh, mine is going to be a little bit of a curveball, So, uh, let me start with you and then I'll jump into mine. I have to go with the devil that I know. And it is the X3 without a doubt, the RC edition. Uh, I know what it is. I know what I can do with it. Um, you know, I, and you're I, talking to the 72 inch wide, a hundred percent. I've had people, uh, hammer me actually in the comments on the YouTube that we never talk about any other machines other than the sport machines. You realize that I've actually put game in the back of the X3, I've checked fence. I've tightened fence with the X3. I live on 500 acres. I live on a farm, and you know, I don't own a horse. And <laughs> I sold all my <laughs> dirt bikes, so that uh, that X3 not only is really really handy. I mean, we we had a lightning storm out there, and uh, lightning uh, hit hit our maple tree, and it knocked down a big big branch. And me and the X3 cleaned it up. That winch was awfully handy. So. The utility factor on the RC edition is, uh, it's handy, no question about it. And then you throw a set of freaking blackbirds on it and go do wheelies out in the sand dunes. But it is the devil that I know. You know, it's one of those cars that uh, we've exposed some weak points on it and got it all fixed up. And I believe in that car uh, a lot. You know, I put it to the test and it's proven itself over and over again. We were about to, you know, with the speedometer error on that, because I'm running oversized tires on it, uh, based on what the speedometer error suggests that I'm actually up over 4,000 miles and the drivetrain on that thing has knock on wood been flawless. And, um, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't consider myself an average enthusiast. You know, I, I beat on the thing for sure. You know, I've gone through, I've gone through whoops, gotten clapped and freaking wrecked it we've we've had some we've had some great times on that car the only complaint that i have about that car it's one complaint and that is that when you've been on the dunes for five days you better have some buddies to go wheeling with because when you're out there with your buddies it's always a good time if you go out there as a family you go out there solo that car makes things so freaking easy it really does it it, uh you know when you're on your fourth or fifth day out at Winchester and you're looking for a line that, uh, that you can't tackle in that car, keep looking. Cause it's gonna, I haven't, I've yet to find one, you know, and you're coming off of a platform that is a 2019 RC edition, yep. right? Which is 172 horsepower stock. I think a 172, uh, we did a three R tune on it and then we busted up to the, uh, the dynamite turbo that Evo has on it. It's running the 85. It's really quick. Uh, you know, you get used to horsepower really, really fast, you know, and, and I've, I've had, I've had muscle cars in my life, dirt bikes in my life, uh, diesel trucks that were squeezed to the max. And, uh, you know, 
my car at 300 horsepower, you got to respect it, you know, because it, it can get a little squirrely, but it's a hundred less than what I want right now. Seriously. Like it's, uh, it comes alive really hot. It's really fun. You know, when we were out of San hollow though, man, I was just, it, uh, I, I, you get used to horsepower. Right. That's what it is. And, and the uh, reason I bring up the horsepower part is because when you first got it and when it was on stock horsepower, um, and then right after you put the, th- you immediately put the three R tune on it. Um, you said the same exact comment stock yeah you know that you you can pick a line you can do it it makes it easy and so i want to make sure that people understand that at 172 horsepower or even 195 horsepower or whatever that that tune put you up to um it's gonna get it gets it done it's gonna get you where you want to go and it's on a nice platform that's low to the ground wide and it can accomplish pretty much anything it does have a few things that you need to upgrade including the lower a arms maybe some tie rods, some, some radius rods. And, you know, obviously we always talk about safety with the cage and harnesses and stuff like that. Yeah. Your visibility is more important on that car than what the car will put up with. Because like, if you can see a clear cut line and there isn't like a G out at the bottom or there isn't a witch eye or something, you know, a mistake, like if your visibility is clear, whatever's in the way of your line, it will figure it out. Like it's a, it's a crazy capable car, but uh, you know, Apologies, you know, and not everybody builds or drives these cars for the same purpose. You know, I've had muscle cars, I've had Camaros, I've had Mustangs, I've had diesel trucks, and I build those things out to scare the living crap out of me. And I haven't yet built a car that scares the living crap out of me. And I'm trying to do it with my X3. Maybe we'll get there. We'll see. You're right. And and the reason I bring up all the parts and stuff that you have to upgrade is because we're talking about buying a new car this year, this coming year, right? And in the 22 models, they've addressed a lot of those issues. So they've upgraded the, the A arms, they've upgraded the radius rods, they've put in a double shear tow link, they've put in uh they've tuned it up to 200 horsepower now. So like you're not even having to do a 3R tune to really get there, right? There's a lot of options in this car that no longer have to be upgraded immediately after purchase. You can literally just put a new cage on it, some new harnesses and go have fun for the next couple years. Right. Yeah, and I've you know, I've driven stroke banshees, driven uh just you know, the gnarliest quads you can shake a stick at, but a lot of those things are made to go in a straight line. And if I was out there on that kind of power duning, yeah, you'll scare the crap out of yourself. But as long as you're just pointed straight down a line going up Banshee Hill or going on a drag strip or something like that, it's not, it's a pretty, pretty stable environment. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like, I like a car to be squirrely. You know, one of the gnarliest rigs I ever had was a, was a Cummins that I had that I freaking shot for the moon from a horsepower standpoint. And that was one of those things that depending on what you did with your right foot, you could destroy that truck. Like, I mean, I've driven tractors that if you don't treat them correctly, they have enough torque, they have enough power to blow themselves up. They have enough power to destroy themselves and you have to, you have to respect that. So you got to kind of be easy with them. You know, I've driven like KX CR 500s and, uh, you know, you had to respect those things for sure. They can bite, they can bite you, but like, you know, 400 is, I would love to hit my car up around 400 and see, see how I like it. So, uh, anyways, Ian's pick, the 2022 Maverick X3 uh, XRC Turbo RR, 72-inch wide at 200 horsepower. Awesome car, awesome platform. Uh, definitely some things that you want to look at, maybe some shock tower bracing and things like that. But for the most part, the car is complete, ready to go. And uh, there's going to be pretty much nothing you can do that will stop that car. So. Yeah, I- I'd love to recommend the new Pol- Polaris. I just haven't driven it yet. Well, you know, new we'll platform. Get, we'll get so. there, for sure. For sure. I, it, by all accounts, it looks like they nailed it. And I'm stoked. That leads me straight into my recommendation for the Pure Sport Market, and uh, what's what's your guess going to be? Honda Talon. It is absolutely the not Honda Talon. It is the Razor Turbo R Ultimate Edition. So we just had the Pro R come out. It revolutionized in the industry as far as like this the setup and the suspension travel, as ergonomics and or um, geometry and all that kind of stuff. But the Turbo R came out the exact same time to a lot less fanfare, right? A lot of people aren't really talking about the Turbo R. The Turbo R is not getting the press time that the Pro R is getting. But it is being recognized as a Turbo S replacement, right? It was the highest, fastest selling Razor that Polaris has had, the Turbo S, because it was a proven platform with all the upgrades. It gave you the width, the long travel. It gave you um, some smart shock technology. It gave you ride command. It gave you all the things that you wanted in a proven platform. 
Well, the Turbo R is now replacing that platform. Like we talked, even in the early days of the Pro R rumors and all that stuff, we talked about this is the new chassis Polaris is going to go with for the, excuse me, the high performance pure sport market, right? The the Pro XP platform was replacing the XP Turbo platform. This is the ultimate culmination of that transition as far as pulling the Turbo S off the XP platform and putting it in the Pro platform. The Razer Turbo R is the exact same thing as a Pro XP, but with all the suspension upgrades of the Pro R. So we're looking at the front end A-arms with the lower A-arm shock mount. We're talking about the new DV um, uh, shocks, dynamic shocks from Fox. We're talking about the upgraded ride command. We're talking about a lot of the upgrades that you would get on the Pro R minus the new uh, cage, minus the new wheelbase, minus the uh, differential separation with the, the new Pro-R has the uh, the sec the rear differential separated from the transmission, right? So this is an interesting pick for me because I can say without ever driving it, without ever, without ever sitting in it. You've been on the chassis, though. I've been on the chassis. I've been in the car. I've driven the car because I know what it is. It's a Pro XP. But it has all the upgrades of the Pro R, and with the durability, the thickness walls, the double shears, the upgraded bolts, all those things that came out on the Pro R are in this car. The only thing you don't get is that that new differential system, and you don't get the um, the upgraded uh, cage and all that stuff. So, here's my <laughs> thoughts on this car because the company has one, and there's some there's some similarities, but there's not. Um, they have I, a Pro XP. I'm six foot four, 220 pounds. The the Pro XP is more comfortable for me to sit in than the X3. I it, would I would vouch for that on any of them. Yeah. The the visibility on the Pro XP is really good. It, it, it's it, actually the, way the, the better than the, the X3. The Turbo R. I I know what to look for on the X3. The the only problem I have on the X3 is uh, when you're coming over a peak on a dune. You know, because you're strapped in that seat and I sit low, so you know you're just crossing your fingers a lot of times that you're not canted. Uh, that you're going straight down it, um, or if somebody's coming, the uh, the the RZR Turbo R is uh, even in the even with stock seats is ridiculously comfortable. You got a tilt wheel, you've got a uh, uh, what is it telescopic telescopic yeah, yeah. telescopic wheel. But just if you just look at the features on this car, you got Fox 3.0 Live X2. Now uh, X2, if I remember correctly, the X2 system was on my yxc uh, uh no these are actually a lot different than those ones okay okay because yeah. i was going to say there was very limited people that could tune that shock that was on my yxc that was the only complaint that i had the reason they call them x2 is because they have both rebound and compression gotcha control. gotcha so if you've driven a dynamics car the dynamics is awesome but running 3.0s on all four corners is awesome 74 inches wide is freaking re is sick you know and a 12 gallon tank now and 16 inches of ground clearance. Uh, 12 gallon tank. I can tell you right now, on a four seat Pro XP, when I guided out in Idaho, I was getting, and this is no BS, I could get on a tuned car that weighs 2,100 pounds, I could get that thing over 150 miles. I think it could have gone 180, just baby in it. And that's amazing for a turbo machine. Right. You know, so, and this thing's going to be, this thing's 1,900 pounds dry weight. I think my four seater probably has that by about 300 pounds, give or take. No, they, this thing's so underrated. It really is. And the only reason I didn't recommend it is because I haven't driven it. Right. Well, I, I think it's a pretty solid choice for anybody looking to get into a car. I think that if you were, uh, price conscious and you and you couldn't muster that that three thousand dollars upgrade or whatever it is to get to the turbo r uh the pro xp is going to treat you right and the reason one of the other reasons that the turbo r is such a good choice for the pure sport buyer is that tomorrow you could buy the car and the next day you could go buy all the upgrades yeah you know and it was good that you touched on it there was no shortage of people upset that they did away with the turbo s here you go Right. And and for all of us that kind of follow this stuff, we knew it was coming, right? Like this wasn't a big surprise as there was an option coming f to replace that model. But I think they did a huge service to the community saying, we're going to put you on a one piece chassis. We're going to put you on a one piece frame we're gonna, or a ch uh, roll cage. We're going to put you on a proven platform. We're going to put you into the upgraded suspension, the upgraded shocks, the upgraded technology. Um, you know, you can make that car sit and ride like an x3 if you want it to or you can build it up to be a mountain monster or you can build it to be a rock crawler i mean it supports all the things 
And the first, the first two seat pro, um, the pro XP that we rode with that I really got eyes on was out of San hollow. It was with guys from rock blocks and his was only 64 inches. And that thing was such a ripper. Well, I think the first one was uh, riches. It was riches, but totally different environment. Like we were on a trip, you know? Right. So the only thing that I, the only thing that I got, you know, cause I drove riches when we were on that trip, I think I put maybe like 20 miles on it or something. And the only thing that I got out of that 20 miles was how comfortable I was and how great the visibility was. You know, I didn't, being that it wasn't my machine, I wasn't flogging it. And when we went out with the rock blocks guys, it, uh, I really started to see how unaffected that thing was by having less width. It really was impressive. They, and, they solidified the 64 inch platform as far as like, it's not limited by its width. It's limited by the technology the dimensions, the geometry, the suspension, the driver is a big part of that. Um, and so, yeah, the platform was solid from the get-go. The Turbo R really just puts it into its mature state of this is what it can be from the factory. And I think it's just an awesome knock it home out of the park type deal. I just can't wait till we get the evolution of that m- drivetrain to where we do get that secondary trans uh diff to be separate just like the pro r and all that and we get the additional wheelbase of the pro r and then we just have that smaller motor option well and the main thing that i want to point out on this thing is when you look at the msrp on the original turbo s two-seater it was the same price as this you're getting an pretty close you're getting well it's 28 and that and the turbo s was 28 so it's just Uh, 20 it's 28 and change for the base models right and i'm I'm recommending the the ultimate trim pull it up pull it up i could have swore it was 28 like I said, for the base trim, so it, the base trim is going to be at twenty six thousand. Oh, so it's thirty two. So I actually correct me if I'm wrong. There were was it the Turbo S four seater that was at thirty two? Yeah. So the Turbo S uh, four seater was around the thirty two thirty four thousand. Yeah. When you look at the checklist, when you look at the checklist on what they upgraded for that thing, how they went wider, more power, different motor, suspension upgrade, it, bigger tires, bigger everything. If you were to do that to a Turbo S. You're literally looking at five grand, give or take. Right. To get, get more power, get more width, get uh, a beefier, suspe- beefier suspension that's not going to die. A suspension like that. Yeah. I mean, you're talking a lot of money. Right. And that's the biggest thing. That's the big discussion that we all go through as people that recommend stuff for people when they ask. Think about what you're going to do to the car once you drive it home. Is it going to get suspension upgrades? Is it going to get cage upgrades? Is it going to get tire upgrades? All those things come into play when yes. you're saying that first off the get-go purchase right so so here's another reason why i chose this vehicle versus the pro r in many states right now when you go buy the car you take it home you are in a gray area of where you can drive and who's an insurant and in a lot of a lot of places you go to arizona you go to california like there's ways to get that car licensed and insured no problem like you just go out to the dunes you go to the desert you have fun there's some states where you go and not only is the forestry saying that you can't drive on these trails without being under a certain CC limit, they're saying the insurance companies can't insure your car because it doesn't meet those standards. So the Pro R right now is one of those bleeding, what I call bleeding edge things, right? Like in technology, we have a bleeding edge way of describing technology where it's coming out, it's not proven, it may break, it may not last next year, whatever. We're just pushing the technology industry forward. And that's the same thing that they're doing here with the UTV market. This is the bleeding edge of UTV progression. And they're saying, we're going to push the limits. We don't know where the laws are going to fall. We don't know where your locality is going to fall on it. We don't know where your insurance is going to fall on it. But we're going to push the industry forward by putting it out there and having people buy it. Because nothing gets pushed until there's a consumer market saying, we have to have this, right? Right. So that's another reason to look at the Pro-R. And specifically, if you are looking at a Pro-R, Go to your dealership, go to your insurance, go to your local government and figure out what you're allowed and not allowed to do with that vehicle before you buy it. So um, so we've picked a all-purpose a per- all general off-road experience vehicle. We've picked a pure sport vehicle. Looking back at this year, what would be your, even though you haven't like driven all of them, even though you haven't like experienced thousands of miles on all of them, is there one car that stands out as like, wow, that I can't believe that this industry is at this place that we have this car now? Well, it's a pro R. You know, I wouldn't call it a revolution. I would call it an evolution. And uh, I, I'm really excited. I mean, we're going to see it at Goons and the Dunes. 
you know, there's uh, uh, one guy that I know is going to have his and then two guys from the uh, Arizona and Southern California area that might be bringing theirs up to it. One of them is a, uh, is a bit of a secret. I, uh, I haven't, I got to confirm that I can get him up there, but I think that there's going to be a minimum of three pro R's at Goons in the Dunes and that is two months away. So we're looking at uh, February to get up to uh, Winchester Bay and, and do some riding? Yeah, 100%. Can't wait. And uh, it's always an interesting time to go to a ocean-facing dune system in the middle of winter. Yeah, I would say it's the, the gnarliest time. The winter annihilates that place. Uh, you know, it was annihilated at Dune Fest. Uh, the winds have been so bad in July that that place had more freaking um, uh, razorbacks than you could shake a stick at, and people just wouldn't go out and ride. And it was epic because I had the dunes all to myself. There was literally me and a bunch of locals. That's it. The locals would go out there and just rip that place apart. But the uh, the people that were there to just kind of take in the event, they very rarely got south of Banshee Hill. That was it. You know, they'd go up Banshee a few times, come back, and that was all she wrote. Which is interesting because you look at why you'd want to go ride in those conditions. I find it interesting because last time we went, I had half worn out knobbies on it, right? And they were bigger tires with no clutch co- compensation. Well, they had some clutch turning, but it didn't have like gearing reduction for the large tires and all that. But we still had, I was able to get 90% of the places that you went in your upgraded X3, right? With paddles. So the wet, heavy conditions of a dune in winter actually lends itself to all the guys that want to go experience the dunes without having all the dune upgrades. To In theory, you know, the winds are so volatile out there that all it takes is roughly about six hours with no rain. And then the way the wind that hits out, you're going to have powder. You know, it's going to be very reminiscent of what UTV takeover in Coos Bay looks like. Well, the first couple of days of takeover, when I get there a little early uh, and have that place to myself, the dunes are just total powder it's like freaking snowmobiling and powder snow like there's the the sand is so soft so the hardest lines out there are wide open there's no tire tracks out there at all and winchester winchester is going to go one of two ways either sand is tacky because it's been rained on or it is absolute powder because the wind's been blistering it but there's two reasons that we that i schedule this event at the end of february one is i'm jonesing you know we went through the winter uh i'm ready to ride I want to get out there. I want to go have fun. The second is the crevasses that are out there at the top of the dunes. You know, it's so sketchy compared to what it is typically during the spring and the summer that it just makes for interesting features. It makes for an interesting test. And some of the dunes out there get these freaking booters that get caught, uh, that get developed by the wind that they're really fun to go up a dune at a 45 degree angle and hit those booters and and jump into the next bowl or jump into the bowl. Uh, What I'm really hoping for is uh, with the power that I'm running right now, with the traction I'm running with those blackbirds, what I'm really, really looking forward to is I want to find some booters that'll get me wheeling on a side hill and off off of a dune, you know, like maybe a 70 degree downward downward dune. I want to start wheeling those. I, I have the power to do it and I just... That sand car stuff, you see sand cars do that all the time. Funkos do that. Uh, Freaking uh, Tatums do that. Uh, I've <laughs> they old, do it without booters, but well, yes. Oh, well, they do it without booters, but I don't have a clutch either. So, you know, I've got to dump the clutch on those things most of the time to get it to do that. But, like, um, I've seen a handful of cars do that. I've seen there's a guy up here in the Northwest that can do it on a YXE. He's got a lot of power. He's got a lot of talent. Um, it takes a lot of talent to do that. It takes a lot of torque to do that. And it, uh, if you're doing it, you know, I... I've only seen one dune or one dude wheelie a gnarly dune. Like I've seen a guy, a guy's name is Josh. He lives in Moses Lake. He's got a high horsepower YXE. I've seen him wheelie, uh, side hill wheelie devil's dune at Idaho. That's one of the tallest dunes. In the, it is, I would say it in choke Jerry, the tallest dunes in uh, tallest and steepest dunes in the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, that's a testament to just a stupid amount of power. And uh, that's the stuff that I want to do with this car, man. Let's, let's get squirrely. Well, I think that uh, a lot of us want to get out and ride, even though, um, you know, a lot of the country is not covered in snow. Our part of the country definitely is covered in snow. And uh, a lot of guys are getting out, putting tracks on their machine and, and um, getting into the mountains. Um, you know, I would say that if you haven't uh, listened to one of our earlier episodes, we had a early on in the podcast, we had an episode with our buddy, uh, my buddy Hank 
uh, Jeremy Hankey uh, from Canada who does survival, Man. does avalanche survival training and all that stuff with snowmobiles and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so if you are one of those people that are getting out on tracks and going into the mountains and getting up in high elevation and into these areas that are pretty epic in visual, you know, scenery and wanting photo ops and all that stuff. Uh, there is obviously risk of avalanche when you get into the mountains. And so uh, as it starts to pile up and people are getting out there and snowmobiles are cutting across them and creating breakpoints in the slabs and stuff like that, uh, go check out that episode, learn about avalanche control and safety and some of the things and resources that you should have on you to be um, able to survive or be found. Uh, and uh, it's just one of those things that you don't think about. Um, as a, as an off-roader, you just think about off-road. You don't think about snowmobiles and avalanche safety and recovery and all that stuff. So just take it for what it is that you're going into a dangerous situation where you may get buried or you may get stranded and there's important ways to handle those scenarios. So, yeah, I have a lack of snow wheeling in my life and I really want to change that up. Um, I have a couple assets that I'd been offered just stupid amounts of money for, and it really got me kind of had scratching my head. I was looking at possibly picking up like an old K5 or 78 Bronco and turning it into a little snow wheeler. You know, snow wheeling's fun in a side-by-side. I've done it, but, you know, going out on a big V8 with some freaking like 40s on it and uh, airing down, packing a cooler, being in a heated cab, there's some boxes that there's ways to check. accomplish all that on a UTV. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, and not sink down as far into the holes when you do. I, I just like the idea of having an asset that I can actually drive to the trailhead and then just go wheel and then go home. It just, I, I would say that trailering up to a trailhead in the snow is always more miserable in the winter than it is in the summer, but, um, totally doable. You know, it's just first world problems, but nonetheless, just having a freaking having a Jeep or a, or a, full size that that I can go mudding in that I can go snow wheeling in it just it's just something I want to check off the list right so uh we talked you said the pro r was kind of your go to like I can't believe this exists in the industry right now um i would uh i'm at a point where i'm kind of in agreement with that's kind of the car you would look at that's, that's the obvious answer um what i'm more interested in is what car isn't in the industry right now like what car hasn't shown up that we would expect to have seen by now being 15 years into this that we don't have to recommend to people to buy. And for me, that would be the paddle shift turbo, you know, high performance sport car. Yeah, no, I would tend to agree. I think that, um, you know, Yamaha came close, but then threw in the towel you know, they just Yamaha them. and Honda have both put out options, but they're not really options for the pure sport. No, not at all. I mean, they're great options for trail guys, for you know, short course guys or whatever, but they're not really options for the guy that's looking to have an epic experience out in the mountains or in the pure sport market. Yeah, if you buy a base model uh, three pedal YXE, you know, you can you can build that into a really fun car, but it does take a lot of money. I mean, you're talking three to five thousand dollars just for a long travel on it and then you gotta throw a bunch of power on it which means you gotta pull the motor you gotta beef the motor up and if you uh, want it to be reliable you have to put expensive parts in it and currently there's a limit to how much power that you can push one of those paddle shifts you know the the yx the uh, uh three pedal car you know we've seen models that are up around five six hundred horsepower from the packard boys but the the, the paddle shift i'm sure there's somebody out there getting big power out of it but Everybody that I've ever talked to said that that paddle shift has a tendency to tap out. The transmission has a tendency to tap out about 250. You definitely have to put a lot of money into the powertrain uh, and then the drivetrain as well to, to compensate. So, Well, and, and, and then you've spent, you know, that you've probably spent $5,000 to uh, to long travel the car and you got to upgrade everything, everything from brake lines to freaking... Uh, Hubs and bearings and all of it. Axles, you name it, and tie rods. And, and I would argue that yeah. all that money put into it really doesn't improve the overall long long period drive experience. Well, they handle infinitely better. A long travel YXE is a night and day difference from a... I've, I've driven a couple long travel YXEs and they handle beautifully compared to the stock one, but does it handle as good as my X3 right now? Yeah. Not yeah, really. but that's my point. They'll like, turn. They'll really turn. No question about it. But, you know, when you're talking about whoops that are knee deep. 
And that all goes back to the wheelbase, right? Like it, when you put long travel on a Wagsy, it becomes a square. And the way that the suspension's set up on the rear, they don't run a trailing arm. Right. And even if you did put the money into a trailing arm setup and, and extending the wheelbase a little bit, like some of these KOH cars that Yamaha puts out, uh, their team drivers. Um, Add another 8,000. You're just adding more money, more time, more custom fab, and you're still not performing at the level that you can buy out of the box in these newer sure. cars. Yeah, and and I, we're going to catch some hate for that, but the podium suggests otherwise, you know? Yeah, and it was interesting to see Polaris not performing at the podium as big as they have in the past. This last, the previous year and then this current year going into 22, we're looking at an option where Polaris might actually perform higher once these cars are in these teams' hands, they get to know the cars, they get to upgrade the cars to find the weak points, upgrade them, and all that stuff. So I'm interested in the racing scene for the next year to see where they end up placing. Um, if we see the the Turbo R starting to place and, and podium more frequently than maybe a Pro R, or if the Pro R is going to become... Because the Pro R is going to be competing in a, in a class all of its own, right? right. Like it's it's going to be competing against itself and maybe a couple other items, but... For the most part, you're not going to see the Pro R become a thing until all the manufacturers have cars to compete at them, at least Can Am and maybe others. But for right now, it's just competing against itself right now. Right. So, and the, and the thing is, the reason we're talking about racing is the fact that racing spearheads the development. You know, like well, the Pro R is a direct repl- a response to the, all the race programs, all the customer feedback, all those guys that are pushing these things to the limit saying this has to be upgraded. Yeah, I mean, it, spear, it spearheads innovation within the industry, but in reality, the average user, the average person that would go out and buy one of these cars, you know, the ratio is probably somewhere around 80 to 90% of them don't really care about racing. You know, they, they're they there as an enthusiast, they want to go exploring. And I have respect for both, uh, you know, the people that want to go explore. That's amazing. You know, I, I kind of scratch that itch for people when I go out and guide, but like in the racing, in the racing industry, I work with these people really closely. That's their life. They just, it's in their blood. They just love it. Uh, so I don't really have a preference, you know, I don't race, but I don't really have a preference and I respect racing based on the fact that it drives that innovation. But, you know, if we want major leaps within this industry, uh, you got to have, racing being covered on ESPN first take in the morning or FS one's <laughs> undisputed in the morning. And, you know, they don't even talk about the day don't want a 500 or the Indy 500, much less what they're going to do on off road. So right. it would be really interesting to see off road, take some major leaps from a visibility standpoint. Cause right now it's only on YouTube, but until some of the major networks and don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I mean, there's some Mav TV and some other stuff covering it, but yeah, but Mav TV is all like subscription based. And I, mean, I can't remember what I saw. I think something to the tune of about 2 million people plus disconnected direct TV and dish network over the last year, everything's going streaming. So I, I just think that there's such a need for high quality off road media right now, you know, something more than a camera and some guy's face just going, Hey, yo, we out here, you know, all that kind of stuff, like documentary type stuff. Uh, you know, where's the dust to glory for UTV? Where is the, uh, the, uh, expedition overland of UTV? And I, I would really like in, in expedition overland is a great example because it started as a YouTube channel and now it's up on Amazon prime and they're, they're huge now, you know, they're doing some amazing stuff. And I think there's a need to, to have that within this market that would really propel this, this, this industry, you know, I mean, overland, a lot of people don't know of it. I mean, the way that off roads ascending, you know, everybody knows that UTVs are going through the roof right now, but so is Toyotas. You know, you can't get a Toyota TRD Pro. You can't get a freaking TRD Pro Tundra. You can't get a, uh, you know, Jeeps are hard to come by even these days. Big, big and, full and size trucks. Like Land Rovers, even the expensive ones are still in high demand as yeah, well. Yeah, America is off roading right now. Canada is off roading. Mexico is off roading. And it is, uh, it'd be really cool if we start to, to find some more accessible, great media within the, within the off-road community. And that's a complaint that I have against YouTube big time because like YouTube, you could produce a movie quality piece of media. It's not going to translate to views. You know, you could spend $50,000 to hire a professional cinematographer to come out and make you the biggest banger known to man. It doesn't mean anybody's going to watch it because of the way that the YouTube algorithm works. Like some of the biggest videos that come out of Dunefest and Takeover are guys holding a freaking GoPro, you know, pardon my French, but I mean the content, the quality of that, I'm going to don't have to pardon my French, but like (laughs) the, uh, the quality of that media isn't great. 
Let's it, just call it what it is. It's garbage. You know, and I'm not hating. It's, it's, it's cool that that stuff's being visible, but YouTube is pushing those, pushing those channels, pushing that media, and it's not great. It's not fun to watch. It's not engaging. You know, I, 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 I know lifestyle Lifestyle is huge in this industry. People want to see personalities. They want to engage with people that they know that they can see at these shows. And, uh, you know, it's just not, it's not well represented. I'd think there's one exception and that's Blake Wilkie's channel, Shreddy Life, you know, and so much of Blake's channel is focused in his garage. You know, imagine if it was just nothing but off-roading, just nothing but being out of Glamis, nothing but being on the Rubicon, this, that, and the other, um, you know, he still gets phenomenal views, unbelievable amounts of views for his garage and, and, and wrenching. And I think that's amazing. I mean, he's a friend of mine. So, I mean, I think that's killer. I'm, I couldn't be happier for him, but I would challenge everybody out there to go onto YouTube and look up a YouTube channel called the story tell now, and it's a vlog and it has its lulls, but when they're engaged, when they're moving, when those cars are moving, there's a cinematic value to that footage and it's resonated. You know, when you look at his view counts, they're off the charts. You know, those type of channels, the Expedition Overlands, the Storytell Nows, I think it's just a matter of time till somebody really scratches that itch. And you and I want to do that, but timing, you know, timing's a bitch, man. <laughs> it really is. Well, you know, I mean, the biggest problem is, you know, income, right? Like you have to work, you have to provide for your families, you have to do all this stuff. And unless someone's going to come on board and front the bill to create the content ahead of it being published you can't really get the ball moving until someone's willing to see the vision and put money into it. Yeah. I mean, timing, I'm taking care of 11 people right now in my life. It's freaking nuts. And, uh, I mean, I, I was answering, I was answering direct message on battery applications on Christmas. You know, it's just, it's a busy, busy business. Yeah. And if you, if you look at, you know, the stuff, the stuff that I'm doing with the, with takeover and all these other things, you're, you're more than half your time of the day is consumed by those things then you have your family cons consuming the other, you know, third of it. So you're only left with this fraction of being able to do something during the day. And I would love to see this market explode with content and, and quality outputs. I mean, we see, look, we you can go onto YouTube and look at some of the stuff Mad Media does and some of the stuff that, um, like the uh, the boys that like Buggy have done and and some of these other places that are willing to put money behind content, and it's amazing. But until the community says, you know, we're going to support these guys in whatever mechanism they can. Uh, it's really never going to explode. Yeah, and you, you just touched on something that really chaps my behind in this industry, man. I'll go on to Instagram or I'll go on to something and I'll see a reel of some slow motion footage of a trophy truck, this, that, and the other, and this guy's just getting stupid amounts of views. It's really frustrating when they don't tag the producers. You know, I drive. I'm, I'm not a photographer. I'm not a media guy, but I work with cinematographers and I know what they're looking for. I know what they like. And then they go, subsequently, they go out and they make me look 10 feet tall. You know, you're one of those guys. And I see so much of that content get dropped onto social media with no tag on the producer, no tag on the cinematographer. You could help their business by doing that. You know, when you Even look at the, just one client, when you look at the high, high, uh, high dollar, high visible trophy truck teams out there, off-road teams, you see the most amazing footage coming out of their media, you know, heat wave does a great job of it. Heat wave will produce a clip and they'll give everyone credit. You know, and that, I mean, we, we work with a guy that generates that quality in media. The guy's name's uh, uh, Russell, Russell Johnson from uh, Reef Creative. And I can actually see his shots, like on, you, on Instagram and stuff like that. I'll be like, that was Reef. That was Reef. No tag, no nothing. I mean, they could single-handedly help his business by doing that. It really kind of ticks me off, man. Yeah. Because all those guys... Uh, aside from this reel that you produced, none of nobody looking at that knows where he placed the Baja 1000. They don't care. They're just looking at this trophy truck going 110 through the sand, you know. And right. and when when you find out how affordable it is to hire a guy like you, to hire a guy like Reef, you know these companies could use information like that, tags like that to source people that are talented enough and have the gear to be able to pull that stuff off, and they don't do it. And it really chaps me. And that was one thing that, you know, when I kind of helped out take over this last year to revamp how they do things with their marketing and their social media and all that stuff, 
one of the biggest pushes I did was I'm going to account for the creator in this post. Like they're going to be tagged in the picture, the video, they're going to be in the content description. They're going to be in the story post. They're going to be involved in this post. They're going to have the opportunity to share it. They're going to have the opportunity to be tagged in it and referenced and, and all this stuff because it's that important. Like we don't have as a community, a lot of ways to give the creators compensation, you know, unless you're willing to throw money at them, you don't really have a lot of ways to compensate them without, sharing who they are with your community. Right. right. And, and and the other thing that you just touched on too is I I want to I want to point point this out. You know, we were we were just complaining about the quality of content and the visibility and the views that certain YouTube videos were getting that were quote unquote like less quality. Those people are going to fire back at us and just say, "Well, the story wins." And you are absolutely right. Mm -hmm, for we, sure. We tip your hat. We tip our hat to you. No question about it. Just because Zach and I are finicky about what camera we use, what angle we use, what lens we use, this, that, and the other, doesn't mean that you're not right. Like if, it, if you have a compelling story and you can take people along for it, dude, my hat's off to you. I think that's awesome. You know, most of the, I mean, there's people that I've reached out to directly that have a direct line to me and we talk about going out and wheeling with each other that are just GoPro, GoPro vlogs. Yep. You know, we don't want to be that, but it doesn't mean that they're not doing a good job. And I want to, I want to have a relationship with those guys, but nonetheless, for the sport to really take that next level ascension, I think it's going to take some, you know, I, I, I mentioned that channel, uh, uh, the story until now, going to check out that. Go check out Raptor Run, Baja Raptor Run. And I think the channel is called Texas Raptor Run, but just Google, just do a YouTube search on Baja Raptor Run. Uh, uh, Trail of Missions. Tra Trail of Missions is a Baja trip that uh, I think Cameron Steele did. You know, it's a great story. It is, but it's you know the the, the production value is kind of kind of cheesy. You know, but like Raptor Run's done really well. I mean, there's some off road content out there that's just beautiful. You know, and, and we want to see that for UTV. Well, I I would just say that as a community, what we need to be doing is is supporting each other and. You know, we if we're gonna repost something from social media and that's going viral or whatever, don't just delete all the tags and all the things that go along with that. Like, actually leave in the accreditation of where you found it, leave in the tags of who filmed it and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to put in all their hashtags. You don't have to put in all their stuff, but at least leave the accreditation. And if you're, um, you know, going to be uh, creating content like we do, uh, like I do with Takeover, like what I do here on Side by Side Guys or or whatever, um the opportunity to share the wealth of content and storytelling with each other is so huge. So like when we go to like take over and we're filming, we're sharing that content with shreddy life with, you know, uh, buggy with whoever that wants it, because we know that it furthers the story and it's, it furthers the content creation around that event or whatever we're doing. And we're more than happy to be a part of it. And then the expectation is that they're going to share in the tagging, the compliments, the accreditation and all that. Yeah. And, and you, you would think that those are business decisions or not. They're relational. They, it just happens to be beneficial to the business. It happens to be beneficial to full throttle that we can get buggy whips media or vice versa, you know, but that's not why we do it. We do it because we love them. They love us, you know, and that's the foundation. And I really wouldn't want to change that whatsoever, but you know, I, I, and, and, we're complaining, I'm complaining about some stuff and I'm not trying to come off as being complaining. I just, I would just like to see an elevation in in some of the stuff. And I know the YouTube algorithm kind of sucks, you know, cause I'll pull up like a search in YouTube and it's just the same crap all the time. You know, it, it really is. And very, very rarely mixes itself up. And I would love for media out there to be developed that, that scratches the itch of what I'm talking about here. It's just YouTube won't show it to me. You know, because when I pull up the search feature, I have to be real specific about what to search for to find that sort of stuff. And there's times I mean, where I search for something very, very, very specific that doesn't show up. Yeah. Unless the, the only way that it'll show up is if I or if you have a link, <laughs> if I have to like I have to have a link or I have to like backwards engineer the algorithm to figure out how it's thinking about that content. So instead of typing in the title of that content, I have to type in like the keyword or the topic or the whatever, and then sort through like five, 10, 15 listens until I find it. Right. You know, we talk about the financial aspect of this undertaking. And I think you and I, you know, we're being transparent here. Zach and I are literally just talking here, but I, we've talked about it for a year and a half, two years. I think we need to come up with a major media uh, undertaking in the next year to year and a half. If Zach reaches out his left and right hand, he can touch thirty to forty thousand dollars worth of uh, worth of equipment. 
we can get amazing shots. We can get amazing footage and we work with amazing people that we can get together and tell a really cool story. And I would really like to do that. So I keep getting asked, when's the next video of the BDR coming out? When's the next review of this product that you said is coming, coming out and all that stuff. Right. And it comes down to managing one life two managing income and the projects are surrounding that. And then three managing the future and how we want to build that future. And that's what I've been focused on this last month or two is how are we going to build the next iteration, the next step, the next evolution of what we're doing, what I'm doing. And there's a lot of moving parts in that. And so I'm thinking about putting out a video, just a, a straight up me on the camera vlog type video where it just says, this is where we came from. This was my intention the whole way. And this is where we're going. And I need your help. So, well, how many shows have we done? 63, 64? This will be the 67th episode. How much money have you made off these shows? I've made zero. Exactly. So that's one of the things that I'll be looking into doing next year, you know, just to give a preview into kind of what to expect in next year is bringing on some sponsors, bringing on some people that believe in what we do. I get told every week on various different platforms, thanks for what you do. We, we enjoy what we're getting out of this and you're making the industry better. Yeah. But well, and and let me let me segue you here. You've made zero. That's not a complaint. We love this. This is awesome. You know. And uh, we're not beholden to anybody. Like, no, we're not, not having to make content yeah. because someone said. And we're going to gonna continue to do it. This is this is awesome. We and we live for this. It, it, it's rad. But it is a situation where uh, goals have financial obligation to them. And, uh, you know, we're trying for sure. You know, I, I, we would love to make dust to glory on YouTube or on you, on UTV, not a, you know, like a race clip or, you know, basically like Overland's version of dust to glory or some sort of UTV lifestyle piece that features some of the, some of the industry's more notable and visible guys have it be compelling. You know, that's always been our plan. It's just, it's a beast. It's a big undertaking. And I got complaints this week from somebody that sent me product to review that was just, they're very, very pushy and very, very aggressive in saying, I expect this now. And from the get go, I said, this is a timeline that's flexible, dependent on life projects, things like that. Um, and at this point, you know, with how pushy they are, I'm debating whether or not even to cover the product from this point forward and maybe just ship it back to them and say, thanks. No, thanks. I'll never recommend your product again. Um, there has to be some sort of flexibility in our, and for the most part, I think our industry is pretty flexible. That's a, that's a, to me, that sounds like a company that doesn't understand your channel. You know, the right. best, the best reviews that you can do for that. And I know you've done specific reviews on product, but the best reviews that you can do for stuff like that is to attach it to that RZR and go out in the mountains and go well, out time. and put it into real world applications. Right. The best review is the one that has the time put into it to validate the points. And so, there's a lot of things that go into that. And when you talk about time, time then becomes malleable in the impact of other things. So uh, what I'm looking to do is to kind of wrap up all the loose ends on this channel to wrap up all the loose ends on uh, the YouTube channel, the the podcast, all these things that I've been working with over the last couple of years. I'm looking to wrap up all those loose ends so that 2022 can be focused on a progression into this new future that I'm going to be talking about here pretty soon. So anyways, we're getting down to a rabbit hole where we could we could pontificate for hours and hours. But. Yeah, but the last twenty minutes worth of dialogue is going to lead to about fifty DMs from me. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I mean, this is the stuff that people want to see. They want to participate in, and to be honest with you, they want to help. Right. And that's a situation where we have to have the time to allocate for it. We have to have the financial resources to allocate for it to go out and do it. Everybody wants to do something epic, and we're trying to make it happen. So look forward to some content from me specifically like one-on-one me and the camera about, you know, the future and how people can help and be involved in this process. It's not just about this podcast. It's not just about the audio you're hearing on Apple uh, podcasts. It's not just about the video you see on YouTube. This is, you know, my, what I want to be doing until the day I can't do it anymore. So there's a lot that goes into that. And there's got to be ways to to see return on that so that we can support it going forward. So look forward to that content coming from me. I encourage you to participate in that content and provide feedback. If you want to help uh, jump on board and be uh, you know a sponsor of the program and what we want to do, um, that's awesome. I'd love to talk to you about that. But we're not looking for partners that just want to throw money our way to get their brand on stuff. We're looking for partners, people that want to work with us to progress this Thing that we're doing. And the off-road industry is absolutely full of manufacturers, uh, high-end manufacturers that outsource marketing. They get a budget and they write a check. 
they don't have visibility on. I, I, <laughs> I work, I, I compete against companies in the battery industry that sponsor some of the most high profile athletes in extreme sports. There isn't anyone that works at that company that knows who that athlete is. The marketing company does that manages their marketing. That's why we do everything in house at full throttle, man. We do this. We, we eat, sleep and breathe this. We, every person at our home office with exception to two is an offroader. You know, this, and, this is and, our life. And blood. some of those, you know, came into your business in your industry not being off-roaders and then they've discovered it and now have, have been converted Correct. into it. Correct. Yeah. I mean, prior, you know, four years ago, the answer would have been about three. Now everyone, everyone's an off-roader. It's, it's just, it, it's something that we love. It's something we've been exposed to. And once that community gets its hooks into you, you ain't going anywhere. You know, it's freaking amazing. But you know, like I said, uh, you just hit the nail on the head. You're not looking for work with companies that just want to write a check. You know, we want people that are invested in it. Like, You've become a personality at UTV Takeover. I've become a personality at UTV Takeover. The show has helped with that. But the fact that you're willing to network in these forums and work with these communities like on Facebook, uh, get in, involved with these communities. You know, Northwest UTV, for instance, has 20,000 members. Uh, if I have a ride that I have scheduled, I'll plan it on there. If I have a ride that I want to take people on at UTV Takeover, I'll put it on there. And that's that's one of the things. It's It's just... It's amazing to get people together. It's amazing to see smiles on people's faces. It's amazing to get out there and shake all those hands. And, you know, if a big company wants to write a check and then just check out and just assume that we're doing the job, that's not really interesting. You know, it's not. That doesn't tell me that they're invested in what they're what we're doing. They're just looking at it as a means for views. Whereas there's companies that have helped me out. There's companies like Amped Off-Road that has helped me out. There's companies like Power Tank, you know, Switch Pros. There's, uh, I mean, even Tenzer Tire recently, they've, they've helped me out in some, some elements and I don't often go to, go to those companies. There's been, there's some exceptions. Tenzer, I absolutely went to them. They're freaking amazing, you know, and they, uh, but it's one of those situations where that's a, that's a huge, huge deal to me to build a car and to build components around that car that I have the ultimate confidence in that are going to get me home. You know, they're, they're, you're right. I'm just not going to take some component because it was free. I've had that happen. And some of the components have, have failed. You know, I'm not going to bash anybody or anything like that, but my, my Yamaha had some stuff on it that I learned from. And when I built the X3, I'm like, I'm only going to work with the people I want to work with. And for, you know, I've been very fortunate, but it, uh, you know, it's just, it's really hard to sit in front of a microphone and talk about components that are built that, you know, you had some issues with, whereas everything on my X3 right now, I've tried it out in the field. I mean, I haven't talked about power tank enough. You've dealt with it too. Like companies like that, or there's just a line of them that, that have helped you out, that have helped me out, that are such an amazing solution for, for what it is that we go out there and do. Those are the companies we want to work with. Right. And there's a lot of people that are behind those companies, right? Like that's really what we're wanting to work with. It's not necessarily the company with the checkbook while the check is very nice and very appreciated. And we haven't had any of We've those We've never checks. had one of those, but it sounds <laughs> so, like it's nice. It sounds like it's an amazing thing. For so, sure. Um, but it's really the people behind the brands that we work with that create an atmosphere, that create a dialogue, that create uh, a networking effect, that create a amplitude in the excitement around what we're creating, what we're covering, what we're doing that, you know, I, that's what I want to be associated with. I don't want to be associated just with a company that just sells a lot of product. Right. And if we want to create stories that people want to see the back country runs are it. There's cats out of the bag, man. I mean, like those, those runs get a lot of visibility and there is not that if you eliminate all the DMs that I get for battery application, the next biggest DM that I get is all always oh, it's always maps. Right. It's maps. I mean, I had a guy I had a guy reach out within like the last 2 to 3 weeks. He and like 4 to 5 of his lawyer buddies want me to guide them on the Washington BDR. I told him maybe. <laughs> you know? Well, that's the best thing about it yeah. is that you can guide yourself. Like it's not a overly complicated thing. It's not like it's something that you have to have somebody guide you. I, it's a weekender. It, it, these guys are, these guys are, that's my guess is they're, they're kind of weekend hobbyists and I respect that. They want to go out with a guy that kind of has been through everything 
that has had those challenges out on trail and that can figure out where to, where we, if we need help, where to get it, this, that, and the other, just provides them with a comfort level. It's flattering. Well, know? what that really speaks to is time. For sure. Like you don't have that knowledge. You don't have that experience unless you've had the time into it. Just like anything else. If you're, if you're getting into welding, right? Like the person that just started a week ago is going to visually look different in its output than the guy that's been doing it for 10 years. Right. And and them asking me to go out and guide that trip for them is the same as me putting a tensor tire or a power tank, strapping it to my rig or you a Razorback off-road cage. It's peace of mind. Right. Well, and it's just that company, that product has the time effort all- allocation, the 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 resource allocation to make sure it's a good product and then it has a history of proven records right like people can say this is a reliable product um and so that's it everything comes down to time right so um yeah that's what i'm looking to do in in 22 this could have been its own show (laughs) (laughs) maybe this will be like a like i have an interrupter in the middle just says and part two well i I guess my thing is is uh, this, this is a cool discussion we should probably continue it on maybe on a live episode because this is the type of episode that I want people get firing off, you know, and and one thing that you proved with the launch of the Pro R was that announcing it beforehand that we we're going to do this made the difference. Because the EV episode didn't have the visibility that the Pro R did. Granted, two that totally, was a last minute thing. To- totally, uh, two totally different machines in in terms of how uh, niche market an enthusiast would be attracted to the car. But if we were to do if we were to do the, uh, just announce that we're going to do a live episode, we have to figure out what time that everybody else would want to be tuned in. And basically like, this is your episode. We want to talk about things like media. We want to talk about things like destinations, uh, you know, troubles that you've had in the community, legalities. I think that that would be a really cool episode. So if you're listening to the podcast or watching it, and you've gotten to this point of the podcast now an hour and 48 minutes into the podcast. You would not believe how many people listen to this start <laughs> to finish. It's nuts. Um, if you made it this far, you're part of that community that we're talking about. You are one of those people that feel like you have something, you have an investment into this community and you have a part of this community. So that being said, if you're listening to this part of the podcast, we want to hear from you. We want to know what you like and don't like and what you think that we should maybe start incorporating and then to answer the questions that we've talked about what part of the week would be best for you to participate in what we're doing a live show a live show that you can participate as a member of our community and have your contribution heard have your experiences heard have your point of view heard because we're just two guys that are in similar formats of industry that we can get along and talk to the same topics and, and do this stuff, but we don't have the experiences you have. We don't have the yeah. products that you have. No, and we're just lucky. I mean, we we're able to get in front of a lot of people that are doing this from conventional enthusiasts that have nothing more to do with this off-road community than going out and wheeling on a weekend to dudes that do it for a living. And that's what a lot of people don't understand about what we do with like the show, for example, like we're an hour 49 minutes now into this. And I plan to do this for, what, 48, 50 minutes? So w- w- this is all freeform. This is just literally us talking about what we love and love to do. So I think, I think those are our best shows. And and we want to hear from everybody else that does that same thing, that's, that still has that same passion, that has that same integration into this community and the sport. So uh, I really want to develop this community integration point into the show. And we want to hear from you on, I mean, it sounds really dumb. What day of the week would you like to do this on? It, it's le- a legitimate question. Which day would you prefer and have the logistical ability to do participation in the show and what time of day and, and all that stuff? Yeah, I, uh, if I were to take a stab, probably the time that makes most sense would be a Thursday on a, maybe like 7 o'clock in the evening, you know? Yeah, it very but, well could be like a after the spending time with the family at dinner or, or right. you, know, you know, some sort of commonality in the industry of, <laughs> you know, we've gotten most of the work done for the week, so now we can sacrifice an hour here or there or whatever. And you know what? Who knows, man? I mean, maybe it comes to a thing that we become Seinfeld. We become friends where, you know, friends, not literally. I'm talking about the TV <laughs> show. But where we, I mean, honestly, that's a great idea. Why wouldn't we just schedule a live show for... Well, that's what I'm saying is like, if I can come out and say, like our buddy, George. I'm not talking, I'm talking every week. No, like, no, that's like, what I'm saying yeah. is like our buddy, George, he does an, a show every Monday night. It's a live, live show right. at a place 
with a guest or two or three, they have call-ins from Skype or, or, or um, uh, FaceTime, Instagram Lives. And they have every, I think it's every Thursday, they have an Instagram Live that they do with somebody, right? And he interacts with the community as they, cha- as they uh, For sure. talk in real time. Like I've sent him thirst traps and he will always talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's my point, right? Like if we can create a consistency uh, and a dedication to a time, going back to time, like if we can wrap ourselves into a schedule that says this will happen every week that you can be a part of, we just need to know where to not waste our time. Like which which day is going to be, which time is going to be the best. And that might be a Sunday. That might be a Wednesday. That might be a Friday morning. Like who knows? But we want to create a show. And this might be auxiliary to what we do here. Like this long form discussion could be separate from that show. Like we don't have to tie ourselves to one or the other, right? Like that's not what I'm wanting to do. Well, I mean, even if we run out of things to talk about, the community is not going to have it. They'll start chiming in. Oh, for That's sure. That's exactly what we need. And I think there's a, a way, the way to do it would be to say, hey, this week we want to talk about clutches. Well, and here's the only downside about doing it like on a Thursday and an evening. How many DMs did you get from mom and pop shops and online catalogs showing <laughs> stories on Instagram of our Pro R episode right. live right. on their TV in their freaking conference room. It was awesome. Yeah, we had multiple uh, businesses showing that their entire staff were <laughs> in the conference room watching yeah. our show. So yeah. that was pretty awesome. And, and honestly, it's humbling to, to know that people incredible. are willing to, to take time out of, the time and money out of their day to participate in what we were doing. Well, in some of the places that we know, we know people that work at them. And when you would see those stories come up, you're just like, that's my buddy. <laughs> you know, that's my buddy watching us. It just means the world. Well, and it also means that we're on the right path. Like we're talking about the right things. We're talk we're doing the events. We're doing the the topics that people care about, and we're not just you know slumming this along. We're actually trying to be good at what we do and do better at what we do every single time. Props on the use of the word slumming. <laughs> it almost came out as the wrong word, so I'm pretty <laughs> proud of myself. <laughs> Schlepping. <laughs> so if that was an offensive term <clears throat> overseas in some random third world country, I'm a, I'm sorry, but yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, let's wrap this episode let's up. We're we're uh, just about two hours. Um, you know, you can find our podcast on Apple, Google, YouTube, Spotify, iHeart, all those different places. Um, and more importantly, you can find us online in the DMs. You can contact us. Uh, you can mention our names. You can ask us questions. You can, you know, give us complaints. You can say, you know, we're responsible for your marriage falling apart, whatever. Yeah. And, um, and uh, come February, you can find this trainer mullet and all of its <laughs> glory out at Goons in the Dunes in Winchester Bay. I just figured you were trying to catch up with uh, Amped Off-Road. <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to Taylor. Um so anyways, long episode, multiple topics that was supposed to be one topic, but uh, that's how it goes with our show. And uh, everybody that's been along for the ride uh, the last couple of years, we really appreciate you subscribing and liking the content. Uh, we really appreciate five-star reviews on iTunes. It really amplifies our coverage there. So if you feel like we've deserved that, please leave one of those. Um, and uh, 2022 is right around the corner. We're going to do probably a looking forward episode to see what we our hopes and dreams for 22 will look like. Um, and this episode is not brought to you by Fox Shocks, even though we're both wearing hats. But if Fox Shocks wants to sponsor what we're doing, we're l- really willing to talk to you. So uh, reach out to us if you are a business that has uh, some interest in what we've talked about uh, this episode. Hit us up in DMs. Um, we have, I have a lot of big things to talk about coming in the near future. So please like, and subscribe to our channels and uh, hit the notification bell if that's something that you do. Uh, and I feel like a YouTuber now that I've said all those things. And, uh, so I have now officially slummed all the official ways to be a influencer. And I think that I will wrap up this episode this year by saying I am 100% appreciative of all of you that have participated in this community. And I can't wait to experience more with you. Peace. Peace.